This is Teach the Rhythm of English with Color Vowel. I'm Karen Taylor. Hi, I'm Karen Taylor of the Color Vowel Chart. And today I'm happy to be talking to you about rhythm and how we can teach it, how we can promote practice and how we can ensure that our learners have a chance to really acquire the rhythm of English that makes them sound comprehensible. Today, we'll talk about why rhythm is so important to spoken English, exactly how we construct English rhythm, how the color vowel chart supports rhythm, and then specifically how we can leverage rhythm through vocabulary chants, reveal the rhythm of phrases and sentences through those kinds of chants, and most of all, do rhythm through an exercise I call pure practice. And I'll let you know a little bit more about English language training solutions and how you can get started with color vowel. I think stories are always very compelling, but when I collect the kinds of stories we do for color vowel, it's because they really reveal something powerful about English. Listen to Liz's story. This is my story. I was in Japan, I lived in Japan. I had a Japanese friend whose English was pretty good, so I, I was not used to misunderstanding him. But he was telling me about a friend of his who was in the hospital and it was a pretty serious illness and they were they had the the IV treatment going on. And I was like, wait, IV? And he said, Yeah. And I said, I've never heard of that before. And he said, It's very common, Liz. And I, I, I thought maybe it was some type of homeopathic medicine or like and I said, Was it a regular hospital? Like it was it some kind of alternative hospital? And he said, no, it's a regular hospital. Like they have it in the United States all over the place. I know they do. They have it all over the world. And I said, gosh, I've never heard of treating somebody with ivy before. Like poison ivy? Like I didn't get it. Then uh, I said, you mean like the plant, you know, the green? He said, no, it's the little plastic bag with the tube. It sticks in your arm. Gosh, you're dumb. And I said, oh, IV. And he said, that's what I said. And I had not really been teaching very long at that point, but I remember thinking that is kind of what he said. I can't believe I misunderstood that. Why did I misunderstand it? But of course, now I get that it's all in the stress. Now, Liz's story tells us something about stress in general and something specific about those two words, IV and IV. Uh, when we hear that without any stress, it sounds like either or both of them, IV, IV. Right. Um, let's try a few more of those just to kind of really visit that idea that neutral stress will leave us in an ambiguous place as listeners. So if I say misery, misery, what two words could that end up being? Just like IV was IV or IV. Yeah, Missouri and misery. That's right. How about eligible, eligible? eligible, maybe you've heard eligible, but also illegible, right? One more, canal, canal, canal. Maybe you heard kennel or maybe you heard canal. Years ago, back in about the year 2000, one of our students was in New York City visiting for the weekend. He's a Japanese gentleman. And surely my co-author on the color bell chart was his teacher for pronunciation. He was a graduate student. He was um, very knowledgeable about English and he was a very thoughtful guy. He was lost in Southern Manhattan and he was walking around with a map, but unable to find where he needed to go. And he, so he stopped people on the street and he stopped two, three, four different people on the street. He'd walk up to each person and say something like, excuse me, what is Canal Street? And none of them were able to answer his question. In fact, they weren't even willing to really try to answer his question. Um, none of them asked, I'm sorry, can you repeat that or anything like that? And so he knew something was off, that he was failing to even communicate that he was worth communicating with. And of course, he was probably fairly stressed at this moment, but he did have the presence of mind to think back to a recent lesson with Shirley about stress. And so he went to the next person that he stopped and he said something like, excuse me, where is Canal Street? And that person stopped 
and said, it's right over there. And so she pointed him right down the street to the next corner. And sure enough, there was Canal Street. So the difference between him saying canal with neutral stress and canal with imperfect pronunciation, but with effective stress made all the difference when it came to getting an answer to his question, finding the place he needed to go. So we should ask ourselves, why is it that so many learners of English struggle with the idea of stress? And I say that very specifically, the idea of stress itself is problematic, let alone the actual exercise of stress. The answer lies with the brain and the first languages that we grow up with. This is a continuum illustrating how languages can be more syllable timed or more stress timed. How a language is timed will determine whether a learner of English says canal or canal or canal for that matter, meaning the way that their language works will influence the way they approach a word of English unless they're given other strategies and more information. Now, languages like Japanese, as well as a number of other languages, including Italian and Spanish, are strongly syllable timed. And for that reason, no amount of emphasis from an English speaker is going to communicate what that speaker intends. Instead, it can come off as emotion or aggravation of some kind, um, but stress itself is not necessarily salient to a speaker of one of these more syllable timed languages. Whereas English and Russian and several other languages have a sensitivity to how much time we spend on that sound, uh, to the volume of that one sound in the word that we call stress. This is called Broca's area. And I'll just mention it because I'll be saying it again later, that Broca's controls the way learners perceive speech and production. Their L2 learning experience is altered by their first language sound system. And so whether they're learning English or some other second language, it's their first language that will determine a lot of the challenges that they'll be facing with pronunciation and with stress in particular. So what is stress? It's worth spending a couple of minutes really understanding the nature of stress in English. We're going to refer to Judy Gilbert's foundational work the prosody pyramid to learn more. Using the prosody pyramid, we can start to understand what happened to our student in New York City. When he asked people, excuse me, where's Canal Street? They were expecting to hear certain rules being followed. And the first rule is that within this question, there is one phrase that is more prominent than the other. So between excuse me and where's Canal Street, which of these is more important? That's right. So the Canal Street part of the phrase is more important. Where's Canal Street? That's the essential question he's asking. And we call that the prominent thought group. Within the prominent thought group though, we can look even more closely and ask ourselves which word within this thought group is more prominent or more important. Where's Canal Street? Where's Canal Street? Where's Canal Street? You're starting to hear it and see it with the word canal. Meaning we don't say, where's Canal Street, but rather, where's Canal Street? So canal is the focus word of this question. Now that we've identified the focus word, we can ask ourselves about the word canal. Which syllable is more prominent in canal? Is it canal, the first syllable, or is it canal in the second syllable? If you're hearing the second syllable stress, you're right. It's Canal Street, Canal Street. And so that is the stressed syllable in the word, bringing another level of prioritization to the prosody of English. And then even within that one stressed syllable, we can go a step further and ask ourselves, which sound lasts the longest in that syllable or which is most prominent? Canal, canal. If you're hearing that vowel sound, ah, you're right. Traditionally, we would mark that syllable with a phonetic symbol like you see here, ah. With the color vowel chart, we provide learners and teachers with a common vocabulary for naming that peak vowel sound so that a word like canal is what we would call a black cat word. 
black cat canal. Gilbert explains that the stress syllable functions as the peak of information within the thought group and that the sounds in the syllable must be clear and easily recognized because this is the center of meaning of the thought group. With that idea in mind, we use the color vowel chart to make sure that students know what it means to be clear in those sounds. The color vowel chart provides a comprehensive map of the vowel sounds of English. And within that map, we have highly mnemonic phrases that allow a learner to quickly name and remember a vowel sound by its color name. Green T is the sound of E, the vowel sound. Silver pin is the name of the I vowel, otherwise known as the silver sound. And so we move into a place where we can name sounds by their color rather than by using a letter name or having to write a symbol somewhere. Now, the image that you saw earlier for Black Cat Canal is one of several symbols that I'll now show you as we walk through the chart. You can use your hand and say them with me. Green T E, silver pin I. Gray day a, red pepper a, black cat a, olive sock a, auburn dog a, turquoise toy oi, orange door or, rose boat o, wooden hook o. Blue moon, ooh, a cup of mustard, ah, uh. purple shirt, er, brown cow, ow, white tie, I. These are the vowel sounds of North American English. Now we can go back to those words that we heard earlier, and instead of simply modeling the stress difference, which might be lost on our learners, we can actually identify the stress difference based on the primary or peak vowel sound. So here's that first pair, IV and IV. The first would be a green T word, green T I V, and the second is a white tie word white Thai ivy. By using these keyword phrases, we are spotlighting the sound of the stress and not just the location of the stress. And this helps students reinforce their learning. Let's try it with the others, ready? Missouri and misery. Purple shirt, Missouri. Silver pin, misery. Next one was eligible, remember that one? So we have red pepper eligible and red pepper illegible. Notice these are both red pepper words. And so it's even more important to have time on the vowel where it is stressed. In the case of the hand here, we're using an extension of the arm to measure that time on vowel. So red pepper eligible and red pepper illegible. Now for the next pair. Remember it was canal. So if you heard canal, you might think, oh, kennel, um, when actually he was saying canal. Um, so those are very different words actually for a speaker of English. And the first would be red pepper kennel, whereas the second is black cat canal. So by pinning down these peak stresses, we then can move into the deeper work of deciding where the unstress is and where we'll start to hear schwa. But that said, there's still a lot of work we could do by simply identifying the primary stress. I'd like to show you an example of how simple this strategy can be and how effective it can be in the moment of instruction. What you're about to see is my colleague, Liz, tutoring a middle schooler. Listen and notice how she's able to guide the learner toward corrections without actually correcting him. And she could hear the impotence in her voice downstairs. Okay, what if I tell you that this word is gray day? Gray day? Mm-hmm. 
in pay in patience. Yeah. She was a no no beast. No bice. Which one? No bice. Okay, I'm gonna tell you that it's an olive sock word. Olive sock no beast. That's right. Mm-hmm. Most new performers never had this large of a uh, crowd. What's this word? Crowd. That word is brown cow. Crowd. Yep. Isn't it impressive how she can simply provide a collar word and the learner's able to make that self-correction? Well, if you thought that was neat, there's actually more to it than that. So think back, what were those three words that the learner struggled with and self-corrected? Let's look at those. Those words were novice, impatience, and crowd. I've marked them here with a line to show where that stress is. And this is actually the very simple markup protocol that we use in Color Vowel to show where the stress is. We then use color vowel images to highlight the vowel sound in that primary stress. So olive, sock, novice, gray, day, impatience, and brown, cow, crowd. But of course, this is a PowerPoint slide you're looking at. So what does it look like in the classroom? Well, the whiteboard would look something like this, right? With the underline just under the stressed vowel letter, and the color word written in all caps to identify it as a sound and not a kind of color that we're picking up out of a crayon box or a color we see, okay? So this is the whiteboard. And meanwhile, the learner is going to write down these words as this learner did in his color vowel organizer. Here, the learner has written down crowd, impatience, and novice into the corresponding categories using what his teacher wrote on the board. Now what he can do is go home, he can review these words knowing how to make them sound the way they need to sound. So now the teacher has corrected the student. The student has had a chance to review and to write down these words that were tricky for him. But there's still one more step and that has to do with internalizing the rhythm. So I'd like to share with you a tried and true way to reinforce the rhythm of these words through vocabulary chants. Carolyn Graham created a very simple recipe for vocabulary chants years ago, and we continue to use it to this day very effectively. So let me share that with you. It goes like this, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, A, B, A, B, C. With this very simple recipe, we can sketch out how a chant is going to go before we even say the words. So if A is the olive sock sound, and B is gray day A, and C is brown cow ow, let's practice how this chant's going to sound, just with the vowel sounds. Ah, A, ow. Ah, A, ow. Ah, A, ah, A, ah, A, ow. Here's what it's going to sound like. Novice and patience crowd. Novice and patience crowd. Novice and patience, novice and patience, novice and patience crowd. In this way, the learner has an easy way to reinforce vocabulary that they've just learned. Another way to instill the rhythm of English is by warming up with the color vowel chart using phrases. So I'm going to lead you through a phrase-based chant now. Uh, you'll repeat after me. Uh, you'll see how this goes, but basically I'm creating a rhythm that you follow. So it's something like this. It's me. It's me. Green tea. It's me. It's simple. It's simple. Silver pin. It's simple. That's great. That's great. Gray day. That's great. Together, together, red pepper together. At last, at last, black cat at last. Come on, come on, olive sock, come on. Call me, call me, Auburn dog, call me. Enjoy it, enjoy it, turquoise toy, enjoy it. 
of course, of course, orange door, of course. I know, I know, rose boat, I know. Looks good, looks good. Wooden hook, looks good. And you, and you, blue moon, and you, I love it, I love it. A cup of mustard, I love it. That's perfect, that's perfect. Purple shirt, that's perfect. I found it, I found it. Brown cow, I found it. I like it, I like it. White tie, I like it. So notice what we've done here is I've collected a number of very common phrases, but I've arranged them along the chart in order of the way that I teach teachers to present the chart, which starts with the front vowels, it sweeps down through the front low vowels to mid, and then up around to the high back vowels. We come back to a cup of mustard up through purple, and then finally with the two big movers, brown cow and white tie. Okay. But in this way, we're able to lead an entirely oral experience with the rhythm of English. So it doesn't have to involve a written chant that students are reading. Every time a student is reading, we're sort of taking one step back while taking a step forward. It's yes, practicing spoken English, but it's with the eyes and it's being tethered to the way we think words sound based on their spellings and how they look on paper. So by getting used to the chart as a point of reference, not just for where a word's peak vowel falls, like impatience being a gray day word, we're able to use the chart to actually organize chants and create sustained learning activities that remain entirely oral. All the while we go back to the written word, but now in an organized way. So with the vowel chart as a point of reference, the learner can write these kinds of phrases right here in their organizer. And in time, if we're talking about phrases in this case, uh, notice how a learner can collect all kinds of purple phrases. That's perfect, I'm sure. Yes, that'll work. See you on Thursday. All of these are what we would call purple phrases because the focus word or the most important word in that small phrase or thought group is purple. They all have that er sound, okay? So, so far we've looked at words and phrases, and those are sort of typical places to look for rhythm. Um, but I'd actually like to look at grammar for a moment and just notice that rhythm lurks in all forms of language, whether we box it up as grammar, vocabulary, or something else. So let me ask a couple of WH questions. Where are my keys? When did you go? What is that? Okay, all of these start with ba 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 or ba 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 ba. Where are my keys, right? We can start to listen to these WH questions and notice that there's actually a fairly predictable rhythm to them. Here, I've highlighted the stressed words with color vowels. Who are you going to see? Blue, green. Who are you going to see? Blue, green. What are you going to say? Mustard, gray. What are you going to say? Uh, a. Where are you going to go? Eh, oh. Where are you going to go? Eh, oh. And where are you going to stay? Eh, a. Where are you going to stay? Eh, a. So isn't that interesting how these questions all feature a similar rhythm? And so that's worth highlighting with the open hand and with color vowels so that we can start to have some dimension to the way English is spoken. We want the learner to know from the beginning, from the lowest level and all the way through the highest level of learning English, that they will not be understood if they simply deliver these words in a string of sounds, but rather that there are some words that are going to have bigger sounds and other words that will be smaller. So this da-da-da-da is a very essential rhythm of English, and we want them to be sensitized to it and to notice it in other places, other kinds of grammatical structures, other situations. 
So I throw that in as kind of a point of intrigue to look for rhythm in all of your textbook lessons, to seek it in a given sentence structure or in any kind of a drill that you come across, you're going to find rhythm in there. However, to really learn the rhythm of English, you have to do the rhythm of English. Meaning if we continue to look at words, we're still remaining text bound. We keep looking at them and even the spaces between the words can interfere with our understanding of rhythm. ColorVal's latest initiative is to provide learners and teachers with opportunities to engage with spoken English without interference from the written word. Pure Practice is the name of that initiative and I'd like to introduce you to that now. Do what I do, do what I do, fast do. or slow, do what I do, do what I do, do what I do, what I do, what I do, do what I do, what I do, what I do. Great. Now that was just warm up. Are you ready to get started with pure practice? Wonderful. What do you? 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 What do you want? 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 What do you think? 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 What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? What do you want to do? 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 What do you want to do today? What do you want to do? What do you want to do today? What do you want to do? What do you want to do today? What do you want to do? So pure practice is structured in a way that allows the learner to listen and join in almost immediately with each new phrase. And it typically expands into something that seems almost untenable, and then it re reduces back down to something very simple. By doing pure practice for a sustained amount of time, like 10 to 15 minutes, a learner is able to really start noticing the rhythm of English musically, and this allows them to bypass that very strong governing faculty called Broca's area, that part of the brain that decides whether the language is going to sound syllable timed or stress timed, and whether or not it's going to sound like English, basically. So you can think of it as a vacation from Broca's area, a vacation from using the first language. And instead, what we're really doing is we're speaking through the musical mind. We're speaking in song. And my message for you is simply find ways, whether it's with pure practice with us or in your own way, to really step away from looking at words so that when we're practicing spoken English, we're really doing it by speaking and listening and not by reading off of a surface. There are times for that. There are certainly wonderful activities that involve reading words out loud, whether it's poetry or reader's theater, but this is an essential vitamin, if you will, that learners often don't get enough of. We are a teacher-built organization dedicated to teacher professional development and especially to professional development around the topic of spoken English, pronunciation, and comprehensibility. To help let people know what we do, we offer free webinars every month. We, of course, offer pure practice as a way to bring people together, whether they're learners or teachers, young or old, advanced or beginning, um, in the act of speaking English. We also support teachers every Friday through a free event called Friday at Five, supporting teachers with technology and joy. Uh, these are just a few of the free events that we provide our community every week, and I hope you'll be joining us sometime soon. Meanwhile, if you're interested in teaching with Color Vowel, here are a few ways to get started, depending on your budget and your context. 
The teacher starter kit includes the poster, which is so essential to teaching because we're able to refer to how vowels are formed in the mouth. Uh, it includes our essential book, The Color Vowel Approach, as well as a set of image cards so that you can identify a sound by its color. The tutor starter kit is a bit smaller. It doesn't include the poster. If you're working just at a table, uh, you can get instead color it out included in that kit. And that is our card game. Um, included in that card game is a mini chart. So you'll have everything you need in a really nice compact bundle. The fully equipped classroom is a little bit of everything, of course. It has our foundational game, color it out, the image cards, mini charts so that students always have the chart with them, the color vowel approach, along with our launch pad and a poster. Whichever bundle you choose, all of these provide you with lifetime access to our color vowel community, which is our private community of teachers in Facebook. To get trained in color vowel, we offer two types of trainings. There's color vowel fast and color vowel complete. I'd like to show you how those two compare and how you can get started. The color vowel fast is a $79 course. It's asynchronous and available on demand. It includes that essential book, the color vowel approach, uh, as well as access to our online community. And you receive part one of our basics training in the form of four 90 minute modules, totaling six hours of study. Also, you receive Blue Canoe, our pronunciation app, which we train you to use through those modules that you'll be watching. Through the FAST training, you receive a FAST verification, and that can be used to fold into getting completely trained later on. Complete is precisely what it sounds like, uh, but it does include a few more features, including the basics part two, and that is a live training component with discussion. And that gives you a chance to really examine the way you currently teach spoken English, some of the beliefs you have that may shift a bit as you learn more about color vowel and how we prioritize prosody and the peak vowel sound. Along with basics part two is basics three, and that's our technique practicum. It's a video-based practicum. It's not in front of students. Rather, it's demonstrating the techniques that you learn through the training. And you receive personalized feedback from a color vowel coach that works closely with you. Another advantage of the complete program is that you'll receive the digital image kit with all of those images that I've just shown you, whether it's the black cat ah or olive sock ah, you can use these images in your own handouts and your own worksheets that you design. Finally, I'll mention that we do have color valve for schools. So if you're an administrator or if you are a teacher who knows that this is just right for your school, uh, we can provide you with a customized quote for training for your faculty team. The level one certificate reflects 12 hours of study and provides you with access to our wonderful array of level two workshops. I want to thank you for coming. Please visit us at colorval.com slash get started for more information, and we hope to see you soon.